Thank you, Niels. Um, I have no presentation. I just have the paper to read, and what I prepared, as the cooks and TV shows always say, I prepared a little thing. So, because we are on, no, that's not my. <coughs> okay, we are. So this is the the side of the library I work for. So the name is Werner Oechslin. He is an art architectural historian uh, who collected some books during his lifetime. This is the reading room with about, on the right side, with about like 10,000 books from the 15th to the 20th century. And there are, this is just not even 20% of the whole collection. And it's public library now. And um, if you are interested in architectural history and everything around from the history of philosophy to the history of mathematics to whatever you can imagine, even Goethe's publications or so, it's almost all there. So this end of the advertisement. Um, yeah, as Neil said, the um, quote of my, the title is a quote of Windsurf's paper of 2015 at the um, AAAS. And so I come to, build to this back a little bit later in the, on the second page of my paper. Electronic publication in the humanities and other fields is still a process following the centuries-old model developed for paper. First, authors write papers about research results, including images and tables using a word processor, producing a digital document, usually in a proprietary format that hardly can be opened with other software without loss of formatting or even information. Second, this digital document is sent to the publisher. Third, the publisher sends this file to someone checking it for errors and accordance to the publisher's guidelines. Four, before the paper is regarded as finished, it is sent at least once back to the author for some sort of polishing. Five, steps two to four usually are repeated several times. Six point, uh, step six, finally the final version of the paper is sent to the layouter who transforms the file into from the word processor's format into another, usually also commercial and proprietary format, and reworks the entire text according to the layout guidelines of the publishers. Seven, the result may be sent back to the author again for final corrections in a form that can that he cannot in a format that he cannot change. Eight, after the last final final reworkings, the file is transformed again into a format suitable for printing and sent to the printer. The printing machine produces, for instance, a book with bindings, etc., and the number required for the first edition. The printing machine, uh, the, the printed books are sent to the bookstores or kept in storage until they are ordered, and the left 11th step is for a few years now. Uh, this process is split up after point seven into two. The second way is the publication in ebook format. Except for the usage of digital files sent around several times in several versions via email or some cloud storage, instead of a writing messenger, sorry, all of this is still identical with the good old paper process. And often authors and publishers repeat some of these steps by using prints on paper several times. So could this be really called electronic publishing? I would not think so. In 1991, Tim Berners-Lee developed the World Wide Web, mostly based on already existing techniques and HTML, to shorten this process of publication and of exchange of um, scientific publications. Since about the year 2000, many steps of this process could be shortened and united with the help of web-based content management systems. But 25 and 15 years later, respectively, these systems with databases and versionings are still not or scarcely used for printable, well-formatted publications. The title of my paper, as I said, is slightly a derivation of a quotation from Windsurf. Surf is a co-developer of the basic protocol used for the internet, the TCP IP, and therefore one of the fathers of the internet. Since the early 1970s, he took part in crucial developments. Today, he is one of Google's vice presidents. Therefore, we should take his warnings regarding a looming digital dark age of our data as well as the lack of any solution for the long time preservation of digital data at least seriously. And with long time I don't mean 20 years. He said these words in February 2015 at the annual meeting of the AAS. The suggested solution he is working on with his team 
is a, he calls digital vellum. It shall provide a soft and hardware environment able to preserve not only the digital documents, but also the software used for the creation and manipulation of them, the operating system the software uses, and even an emulation of the hardware that the operating system is running on. Let's put aside the crucial questions of commercial licenses, which usually would not allow to run the software in ever-changing virtual environments. And let's also put aside other questions about those digital data that are not documents in a broad sense. Most of the databases today um, may still be able to print out the entries in one set of data, but its form surely will not be sufficient to be regarded as a print, printed, printable scientific publication. And of course, the pure amount of data and data sets will make it impossible to print them out after every change. Let's in addition put aside questions regarding online platforms where data, layout styles and their definitions, as well as software for specific functions, etc., are distributed over several servers literally all over the world and combined ad hoc. This should cause a fundamental problem for the digital vellum, and I still wonder why this point was left out by the developer of the TCP IP. So after letting aside all these fundamental questions and problems, should we follow WinServe's advice anyway and print out our photographs or other documents as long as his digital vellum is not available yet? Of course, because no one can guarantee the preservation, let alone usability, of any digital data format for more than 20, let alone 50 years. Archives plan to make sure that simple and open formats like TXT and PDF hopefully, and image formats, will be available for up to 50 years. But even this is not for sure. File formats like Microsoft's Word, Doc, DocX, are even definitely excluded by archives. Based on experiences with digital data formats from the last past 30 years, I surely would doubt that any possibility for such a long time span of, um, of, of preservation. When I started programming in the early 1980s, the answer to the question, how should we store our data for the longest time possible, would have been um, put the paper punch tape into a dry and cold armor. At the moment, there is no way to ensure that the digital data we work with will be usable even during our own lifetime. Should the creation of such data not be regarded as waste, even willful destruction of life and working time, and as well as resources? So print them out, at least those worth surviving the next 50 years. But with this, with this decision, another problem arises. The layout of our digital documents as they appear on the screen is usually not very satisfactory, often not even acceptable for scientific publishing. This is even more astonishing when we take into account that the basic tools for scientific publication, mostly word processes and typesetting programs, have by now been available for more than 25 years. In addition, the tools for web-based content management, able to replicate the publication, publication process described above, also have been available as content management systems and in other systems even longer for at least 15 years. And both publishing tools as well as web-based content management systems are using markup languages. So why is there no unification of both, one widely spread and used as a standard tool and based on free software? As far as I know, at the moment, there is no such software available. Some publishing houses use web-based editing tools that their authors may use, but according to their warnings, even these tools do not generate a document that looks exactly like the one that finally will be printed. And in some of the cases, versioning and annotating seem to be very difficult. But these tools are private, closed source, and in-house applications, not available to others. The by far larger group of professional publishing houses does not even offer such tools. They require that authors to follow their specific guidelines written in MS Word or PDF documents of more than 100 pages that authors are expected to read first and fully keep in mind while writing their papers. Some publishers offer MS Word templates that can be filled out by the authors with their own texts, and you know how easily you break the format uh, uh, guidelines inside a Word document. Only a small number of publishers are also offer LaTeX templates, but these are mostly directed to natural sciences. To, uh, to humanities and historians, LaTeX and its free interface tools usually are unknown. So especially these authors are bound or bind themselves 
to non-free word processing software and operating systems and regularly encounter problems should they, for instance, try to reuse or rework their own documents written some 10 to 15 years ago with earlier versions of this very same Office program that they used. The solution, from my point of view, would be a combination of a free open source content management system like Plone, based on the web applications of SOAP, and its object-oriented database, ZODB, both written in Python, also free software, and LaTeX. Both Plone and LaTeX can be run on any operating system, and a working proof of, proof of concept solution already exists. It is called FTW Book, provided as a clone module by the Swiss software company for Teamwork. That's the FTW. Because it is free, it could be extended by anyone with some experience in Python and LaTeX into a more general tool. For example, offering different LaTeX-based designs and document classes or new layouts preferred by any publisher or institution. In fact, that is what we are doing now at the Google Summer of Code. What are the advantages of such an extended version of FTW Book? Because of the customizable right, user rights and role managements, the entire process described above can be applied to the CMS and adapted to almost any special need of institutions or publishers. The CMS versioning allows to go forth and back in the editing process and keep control over the versions at any time. No document versions have to be sent multiple times between the participant of the publishing process because they remain in one place, available to any authorized person. The available formatting functions offered in the web interface can be limited to avoid authors breaking them, a big problem in all word processing programs causing lots of additional work. The final print layout is always available for controls at your fingertip. The process is protected by the CMS against unauthorized access, as long I would add satirically um, you don't use PHP. Uh, this process is protected by the CMS against them. Yeah, uh, the final document can be made unavailable or unavailable over the internet with a few clicks, even if print version is not, even if a print version is not yet on or intended for the market. But any authorized reader may print a PDF or postscript copy, for instance. Changes can be easily done while the original is still available. Different editions of the same paper, project, book, whatever are available at any time so that links set to an old edition or an old version will not break because a new one has been published in the meantime. This would allow, for instance, to update the book on an almost daily basis. When a change has been made to its content, it could not only immediately be online but also appear in the next printed copy. For instance, when you use Book on Demand. While these and other advantages regard the publishing process of scientific documents, there are even more important advantages for other aspects. Not only a publishing houses could use such a system, but any institution, group, researchers, or even private person having a server at hand, like your smartphone that would have been a supercomputer 20 years ago, more powerful than all the servers the internet was running then on. The software could be used to build up scientific repositories, for instance, for open access strategies, because all components of the software scale very well from laptops to groups of distributed servers. It would be possible to have a copy of the system run on personal computer of members of an institution or, for instance, students. They could work on their text even when they are offline in some archives or so, synchronizing all preserved versions later while observing the layout required by the institution or publisher. A simple synchronizing tool available for SOAP guarantees the identity and integrity of the documents on the official servers with those on the local computers, laptops, or even uh, smartphones. With the rapidly growing technical possibilities of handhelds, these should be also able to run the entire software system very soon and serve the data to the internet or synchronize them with the servers. Any Ubuntu-based tablet, for instance, could already do this today. The freedom of all components allows for constant development and adaptation of the entire system, from the underlying operating systems to the hardware. Of course, it would be useful to have large research institutions like the D DFG or the Max Planck Society or others provide central repositories for, of the freely available parts of the software for the publications generated by their members or by projects they finance. Those institutions could even provide hosting services for projects and vice versa require these projects to make their results available online via their repositories in any open access strategy available. 
Of course, not every paper, article, book, etc. would have to be printed, but everyone could be printed and therefore, according to Vincerf's suggestion, be preserved even for a distant future. So everything seems to be wonderful with this suggested solution, or are there disadvantages? Of course, there are. For instance, if the usability and standard conformity of the system should be preserved, this would radically restrict the many, as I call it, bells and whistles often used in research projects. Everything that does not fit on a large page of paper to print out would have to be excluded, almost. Well, not completely, it would be possible, for example, to have large images with very high resolutions, to have big sets of data or so uh, linked and connected to the reduced images or data sets in the book or in the printable version. But of course, such high, resolu such high resolution data um, or data sets, images or data sets, surely will not survive as long as the printed counterparts or their mother document on paper. Another problem could arise from projects where data and information are intrinsically very closely linked to each other. This would make it almost impossible to represent them in a printable form. In these cases, the solution could lie in the generation of reduced abstracts or reduced data sets that would be imported automatically from the original databases, for instance, into the suggested system and then be formatted to print for printing. Again, one would lose some data, but depending on the decisions made regarding the exported data sets, at least part of the work and resources put into these projects could be preserved for eternity. The proposed system does not only establish a real environment for electronic publishing, but really electronic publishing is without the um, forth and back for the first time, I think, but also provides a solution for the looming, for the looming dangers of the digital dark age that Windsurfs, Surf and others are warning about and archivists and librarians are or should be aware of. One could even imagine that such system could develop into a general standard for publishing and digital preservation. Commercial software could have plugins to allow its users to publish their text without having to leave their familiar word, familiar word processor. For scientific database projects, it could, be, it could offer a solution in the form of repositories that would help to avoid um, that would help to avoid masses of data compiled over years being lost after a short time, just because, for instance, the financial support for the project and or its servers has been turned off. In cases where server systems spread all over the world are used, for example, like some Facebook of science, there should at least be a plug-in to the suggested solution to create printable documents at any time from any place. For such already or soon very common use cases, I do not even see a future in Windsurf's digital value that focuses on one computer. So that's what I wanted to say. And now I give you a short um, no, yeah. example. So this, what we have here, is the, is the basic um, tool, and I use it for my work now. I'm working on a catalog of architectural drawings, and these are the drawings from uh, that I work on from Vienna. The yellow parts are submitted for um, review. I mean, in this case, I am a reviewer, reviewer myself. I just made it to show the difference. The blue parts are already published, and the red parts are still private, so only accessible to the others. And now I decide to make a PDF of it, but I exclude the commentaries. I could have the letter code, the zip archive, and we plan other formats, especially PostScript. Um, for printing machines, and then let's see what it does. So this part of the catalog is about 50 pages or so, but it works also, uh, let's see what, if I can have the double pages. Yeah, the problem is um, it should be with a start with a left blank side, and then this, what you see is on the left is the right uh, title page, then you have the table of contents automatically, and of course with clickable links. And then you have your chapters going through the book whenever you want. And you can print this, you can send this to any um, um, book on demand publisher or so. Yeah. So and we are now working on with a student from China uh, in the Google Summer of Code to develop this into more 
different files, file versions. And of course, the whole thing here, the whole, this is just a hierarchical data structure in my database. And every part that is open, that means blue, can be searched by, uh, indexed by search engines. So it is a database, it is a website using the database for my work or for any work. And it is also a printable book at any moment. That's it. Thank you, Bernd. Are there any questions? Astrid? <coughs> Thank you. That was nice and full of nice ideas. I haven't heard of it before. Um, you mentioned um, that it was be useful that uh, large organizations would run these kinds of repositories. You mentioned the German Research Association. Did you actually try to talk to them or ask them if they are interested to run this? Because, um, they should because be interested. it's still in development, it's just a, yeah. what you see is a, a prototype or proof of concept. And we will apply for a funding of a, let's say, better final development with professional pro programmers in Switzerland with the Commission for Technology and Innovation. And maybe they are usually not supporting humanities, but maybe in this case they make an exception and would provide support. I would think that is the, the original program, the prototype, has been written by a programmer in one week. Because, yeah, as I said in the beginning, it's markup languages. You also simply write more or less a parser, uh, making one markup language into another, and then say to LaTeX, okay, make the PDF. So this could be done easily, but with more NICEs to have. So for instance, web interface where you can customize the result of the, the book. Now that it's a simple LaTeX class used for the book, but if you want other colors, other formats and so on, you can use, you can still uh, work with the LaTeX file that comes out of the, the system. But of course, most users and even publishers don't want to deal with these things. They want to click something and say, I want this, this format, I want this color, I want my image here and so on. But this is yeah, more customization. The basic functionality is already there. Yeah. Just a, quest a practical question. The, you have shown us how to produce a book out of uh, several subparts. Which format is used for these subparts, actually? Um, you show the whole list of titles, subtitles. So this here, in, uh, where's the mouse? I don't like Microsoft, the Microsoft doesn't like me. Um, so you mean this part here? Yes. Yeah. Where does the information come from? What format is it and how has it been produced? This is, these are poor HTML pages, more or less linked to each other. It looks like you have a folder and inside of the folder you have documents. So every step to the right is a folder and its subfolders or its documents yeah. inside. But the folder itself is more or less only a HTML document. And these are um, um, preserved in the database. Yes. So uh, that's why any, um, and they are linked by each other so that any search engine could go as long as you allow access to the part you want, as deep as you yeah. want into this um, HTML system. Yeah. That's it. So it has not all these bells and whistles, as I said, for instance, big databases use things like, oh, I have a field for this and I have dozens of fields of that. I worked for a pro project where we came up at the end with more than 1,000 fields. And then we said, okay, this would not be usable for any, at least, humanist um, to work with. So I think to keep it as simple as possible and just make the data, the results of your re research available, it's just a very convenient system which could be, there are hundreds of plugins for this system to make for special needs like shop systems or, uh, I don't know, publishing of, of large amounts of digital data, movies or whatever. So that's extensible in any direction. But what I focus on is a very simple interface. So when I want to start, for instance, to edit a part here, then I could just start and as I prefer to say, you have the 20 or so okay. buttons mostly used by any word user on top, but he cannot break 
the system or the formatting, because this is preserved to LaTeX and you have to have access to the LaTeX files to change the, um, the layout. Does this answer okay. your question? Any other questions? I have one. Um, coming from a publishing background, I was just wondering on a practical note, when you say you export the PDF with, with low resolution images, how or high. I mean, the you can do high and resolution right for printing, but I, when I speak of high resolution, I mean architectural plans of this size mm -hmm. with like some uh, 500 megabyte TIFFs or so. So that's not really printable in a way. Okay, but you can choose to have the, yeah. the print ready and fast. Great. Yep. Well, thank you, Brent. <laughs>